Good morning, Lighthouse. I trust you well. As you can see, I'm speaking from City Church in Charlotte in North Carolina. I arrived on Thursday night and uh, I'm busy recording this on Friday afternoon. It's such a blessing to be here and to be with Mark and Marie and kids. Looking forward to a great weekend. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to get into the next series that we have lined up for us. Father, we love you in Jesus' name. Lord, I want to thank you for Light us to the Nation's Church. I want to thank you for the privilege and honor of leading her and being led by you. Lord, we pray, let your kingdom come, and let your will be done at Light us here on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we, as we look over the next four weeks at these, uh, your great biblical motivations that you have for us as your church, I pray that it would just not be information, but that it would be revelation that brings transformation and vision and purpose and motivation and direction to every single person in Light Us to the Nations Church. No matter who they are, no matter what they're called to, Lord Jesus, these, 10, these 11 things that you have called us to move us and motivate us, to help us to see what you're seeing and to be able to, to hear what you are saying to us as your church, Lord. I pray, Father God, that we would align our hearts with your word, with your spirit, and with your kingdom over these next four weeks in Jesus' name. Lord, we just come against every vain thought, every imagination, every hard thing that will itself itself above you, above your word, and above your spirit. We bind it and we rebuke it in Jesus' name. And we pray, Father God, in place of that, that Holy Spirit, you would lead us, you would guide us, guide us. you would open our hearts, that you would help me, that you would help my hearers, as we look at these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. In Hebrews, it says that for the joy set before him, Jesus scorned the cross and endured its shame. I don't know if you've ever asked yourself, what was that joy? What was the thing that Jesus saw that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and scorned its shame? I really believe that if we can see what Jesus saw, if we could understand what was motivating Jesus, what was motivating the Father, what was motivating the Holy Spirit, what do they see when they look at Project Planet Earth? It's going to help us as we understand the church, Jesus, the Father, the Spirit, and what actually it is they're trying to see accomplished on earth. And over the next four weeks in March, we are going to be doing a series entitled Jesus 11 Great Biblical Motivations for us, His Church. And we believe that there are 11 biblical motivations that inspire us to work with Jesus in what He has called us as a church to do within the world we live, within our families, within the communities that we live and move and have our being, and within the businesses that we either own or work at. God has got these 11 motivations that He wants us to carry into these environments. The motive of why we do something always informs and affects how we go about doing the particular thing that we are wanting to do. And so we need to know that we need to know what our motivations are and what our motivations should be, and we should be getting those motivations from the Lord himself. Foundational to this is we need to realize that the call for us to be the church in the world is as important for a full-time paid minister like myself as it is for every other expression in the life of the church. You see, you need to know that the church, um, in, in biblical terms, is called the ecclesia, and the ecclesia basically means the called out ones. Every single one of us are, are God's church, God's ecclesia. We've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And he wants us to be something, and he wants us to do something with him for his glory, for the advancement of his kingdom on earth. All right. And so I believe that there are various calls, and there's at least five of them in the believer's life. First and foremost, the Father calls people to salvation. There is a call to salvation. There is a call to adoption into God's family as his royal sons and daughters. And this is obviously the starting point for us to be the church. So the second call that comes after salvation is the call to serve. 
in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says that we are God's workmanship, created anew in Christ Jesus to do the good works that he prepared in advance for us to do. And so when we get saved, we become a part of the priesthood of all believers, the saints within the church. And for us as priests in the life of the church, we are called to serve the Lord and to serve people within our church, within our family, within the community in which we live, and in the businesses that we either own or operate in. Thirdly, some of those that are called, some of those people that are within the priesthood are called to be deacons. And that's distinct to the call to be a priest. Not everyone is called to leadership in the life of a church, but some people God calls to be deacons within the life of a church. And they are to assist the elders in leading the church. The fourth call is that some of the deacons God calls to be elders. And we believe that the highest human authority in any local church are this group of men called the elders. And they are to stand before God and will give an account to the church one day, to God one day for the church. And then fifthly, some of the priests, deacons, and elders are called to be translocal gifts that serve the church universal operating translocally from one local church into different local churches all around the world. And that fivefold ministry is prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, and apostles. So those are the basic calls that there is within, within the scriptures. And I want to say this. This is so important. If you are called, and I say just in inverted commas, to be a saint, a part of the priesthood in the life of a church and within the kingdom of God, that is not a, it is not a low call. It is a high call. You see, as a church, we are to be God's kingdom ambassadors on, on earth. God has called us out of darkness into light, out of the kingdom of darkness, and into the kingdom of his son in which he loves. And we are called, no matter where we are, if we are believers, to represent God's kingdom, to advance God's kingdom on earth wherever we find ourselves. David, Moses, Joshua, Nehemiah, Esther, Mordecai, Deborah, all these Old Testament priests, they were not full-time paid ministers in Israel. No, they, were, they had secular callings or, or jobs, but they represented God's kingdom on earth. And you need to see that, that it is a high calling for you to be a representative of the King Jesus on earth wherever you find yourself. You see, you need to understand this, that you have an identity that supersedes your vocation. And that identity is that you're a son or you're a daughter of the Most High God and you represent Him and His kingdom on earth. That is amazing. Here's a question that I want to ask you. Within these calls, are you working for Jesus or are you working with Jesus? You see, I firmly believe this, that God doesn't want you to do anything for him. Rather, it's you that he wants. It's you that he loves. It's your personhood. God loves you. God wants you. God is always pursuing your heart. The Trinity are highly relational beings that love their sons and daughters way more than they love and appreciate the work that their sons and daughters do for them. That's an amazing truth, and you just need to let that sink in. You see, God calls us to work not for Him, but to call, to, calls us to work with Him, with His glory, so that we can bring glory and honor back to them. And what this means, in order us to, to go higher and further in the call of God on our lives, we need to go deeper into our relationship with the Lord. We want to, if we want to go higher with the Lord, or if we have been, we've been Christians for a long time, and we see there are cracks appearing in our relationship with God, in our, in our Christian witness, then we need to go back to the foundations, and we need to look at the foundations. And I believe that 
what motivates us and what moves us and what drives us as believers are the foundational things that God wants to get right in our hearts. In Proverbs chapter 4, it says that, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And so the motivations of our heart, no matter what we think, are so important. And if we can align our motivations for what we do in life and on earth with God and His plan and His purposes, my friends, I think we're going to, be, we're going to just see that life is going to be so much easier, so much more enjoyable, so much more fun, because we are, doing, we are aligning with the will of the Lord. Remember there is... Yeah, remember there's the general will of God and the specific will of God. And if we give ourselves faithfully to the general will of God, then the specific will of God is going to find us and it's going to chase us. And so these 11 motivations uh, that God has for us, I'm going to mention them now and uh, over the next four weeks that we're going to be preaching over them. The first two that I'm going to cover this work, week is one, God's great love for us, His church. Two, the great commandment. Week three, we, sorry, that's in week one. Week two, we're going to look at the great commission, the great authority that we have as believers, and the great serve that God has got for us to do. Week three, we're going to look at the great advance that God wants to see take place in the earth, the great destruction that God wants to see take place through His church, and then the great construction that God wants to do on the planet. And in the fourth and final week, we're going to talk about God's great glory that He has for us as His sons and daughters, this great salvation that we have, and the great grace that God makes available to us to get this thing done. Amen. So, in the remaining time that I have, I'd like to talk to you about the first two great motivations that we have as believers. And the first of those is God's great love for us. I told you guys a couple of weeks ago that um, about four years ago, one of my best friends at the lighthouse came to me and said that uh, they were thinking and praying about leaving the lighthouse and going to another church. And when I asked my friend why, he said, Bruce, I know that part of our vision as a church is to be a base church and to be a healing community and that, that is underpinned by the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. And he says, I have no problem with the Great Commission. I have no problem with the Great Commandment. He has my problem. When you communicate to us, you communicate it in such a way that it makes me feel like it's an obligation and a duty for me. And the reason for that, he says, is because you don't start with God's great love for me. God's great love for us. God's great love for the church. And he says, and because we miss that love, we're doing the great commandment and we're doing the great commission, but out of a sense of duty, not awe and wonder. Anyway, it was a defining moment in my life because I really believed that he was, what he was saying was truthful and I couldn't argue with him. And I just I had to go before the Lord and I had to repent and I had to say, Father, Help me. Give me a revelation first of your great love for me, for us, for the world, for the church, so that this never becomes a duty and an obligation, but it always remains a privilege and an honor because I've experienced your love. Anyway, so my friend proceeded to read these couple of scriptures that I'm going to read for you. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19 says this. We love because He first loved us. 1 John 4 verse 10. This is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He has loved us and sent His Son as a atoning sacrifice for our sins. 1 John 4 verse 9. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. 1 John 4, 16. And so we know and rely 
on the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. 1 John 4 verse 17 and 18. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world, we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment and no one who fears is made perfect in love. And as, as my friend was sharing these scriptures with me, I realized that for a lot of my life, most probably a large portion of my life, I was serving the Lord, not out of a love for the Lord, but out of a fear and out of a lack that if I didn't serve the Lord right or properly, or if I made a mistake, or if I didn't do the great commandment or the great commission or something else, that I was going to be in trouble and that I was going to get a hiding. And so I was being motivated by fear and not by a love for God. And my friend was pointing this out to me. I want you to listen to the scripture, Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You know, my friends, there's that song, I could sing of your love forever over the mountains and the sea. The river of love runs for me. Happy to be in the truth. I will daily lift my voice and sing of when your love came down. And I'll be honest with you, my friends. I remember one time I was singing that song at a conference of pastors. And I just, while I was singing, I said, Lord, I, wanna, I, I can't sing this song with 100% truth and conviction. Because if I'm honest, Lord, I don't think I can always sing of your love forever and when your love came down. And I said to the Lord, please help me, Lord. And when my friend was talking to me, the Lord reminded me of that prayer. And I want to tell you, this side of that conversation, five years later, I am more in love with Jesus today. I'm more in love with my wife. I'm more in love with the church, with ministry, with the nations, with serving Jesus than I ever have been in the 51 years that I've been on this earth. And I can really say with integrity, I can sing of God's love forever. And God's love has been shed abroad in my heart. And my friend, this we need to understand is the first motivation that God has and wants for every believer. Not that we love him. No, that he loves us. We love because he first loved us. I want to ask you this morning, have you come to this place in your Christian walk, Lighthouse, where you understand that God loves you, that God is for you, that God will never leave you, that God will never forsake you, that he will always be with you, and that he's always for, for you. We can only love God in response to God's love for us. And I want to tell you, I've tasted and I've seen that God is good, and I've tasted and experienced God's love for me. And now, like never before in my life, I'm able to love him and to love people in return. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 8, B, Jesus says this to his disciples, freely you have received, therefore freely give. And have you lived long enough with the Lord to come to this realization that we can only give to others what we have first received from God ourselves? I tell you, this is a revelation for me, and this is the difference between religion and the gospel is that in the gospel, everything that God asks me, everything that God asks of me, God first wants to give me. Mark Bailey, my friend, who's actually here in Charlotte, told us years ago, Jesus always says, come, before he says, go. 
Jesus says to the disciples, you, freely you have received, therefore freely give. And I'll be honest with you, up until this conversation with my friend, I used to think, man, I've worked hard for God. I've been, I've been working hard for God all of these years. And, I hadn't, and that was my problem, that I'd been working hard for God. I was working for God. I wasn't receiving His mercy. I wasn't receiving His grace. I was working for it. And there was a low level. There were low levels of joy. There, were, there was a lot of obligation. There was a lot of duty. But there wasn't a whole lot of love. Listen to the scripture that Paul the Apostle writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. What do you have, Corinthians, that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as though you did not receive it? Isn't that amazing? Paul the Apostle says, hey, you need to receive something. And everything that you have, you've received. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 19, when Jesus called the disciples, he said, come and follow me. And then he said, I will make you fishers of men. You see, as you come to him and you be with him, he then makes you into what he's called you to be. And this is a revelation to me. It's been a revelation over the last five years that has been progressively growing in my life. Have you ever said, Father, glory to me? I mean, as we hear it, we think, geez, what an arrogant prayer. But in John chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before he goes to the cross. And he says this, John, 1, uh, 17, verse, John 17, verse 1. After, this Jesus, after Jesus said this, he looks toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son so that your Son may glorify you. See, Jesus understood that in order for him to bring glory and honor to the Father, he needed the Father to give him his glory and honor. And then in John 17, verses 4 and 5, this is what Jesus said to the Father as he's praying. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had before the world began. So Jesus understood this thing that he needed to receive from the Father glory and honor. And when he received the Father's glory and honor, he could work with the Father's glory and honor to do the work that Jesus, that the Father had called him to do. And in so doing, he would return glory and honor back to the Father. This, my friends, is the first and most probably the greatest motivation that we can have. This is love. Not that we have loved, that God has loved us. Now, my friends, he has a revelation for me. Do you know that if you lack love, you could ask God? Just like it says, if you lack wisdom, you can ask God who gives liberty without finding fault. If you find yourself at any time lacking love for anyone or anything, stop and say, Father, please help me. Fill me with your love. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 again. Father, hope does not disappoint us. Please pour your love into my heart for my wife, my children, my job, my business, my country, my government, my president, my pastor, my church. Whatever it is, if you find you lacking love or your, lo your love tank is low, ask God and he will fill it. The Bible says that you have not because you ask not. And when you ask, you ask with the wrong motive. I'm telling you, if you're asking God to fill you with His love, then you've got the right heart motivation. And it's one prayer that God will always answer for you. Jesus was asked one day. Well, let, let's read it. Mark chapter 2. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Notice that Jesus had given a good answer. He asked them, of all of the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, Jesus answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater command than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right saying that there is one God, 
and is no other but him. And to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And so once we've established this thing that I need to experience God's love, what do I do with that love? Jesus says, well, now that you've experienced my love, this is what you need to do. There's a vertical application to my love, and then there's a horizontal application to my love. And the vertical love is this, God and me. I experience God's love from me, and I freely receive that love. Then what should I do? The best thing I can do with that love is that I can use it to love God in return. One of the accusations that God makes against the nation of Israel in the Old Testament is that these people seek my hand and not my face. You see, when we seek the Lord's hand and not his face, we are looking for his blessing instead of the blesser, that one who blesses us. Okay? God wants intimacy. God loves us. His love is perfect. And God wants intimacy with us. And for us to have intimacy with God, open our hearts to him. And we need to return his love back to us. Some believers, they don't want intimacy. They're just looking for God's hand. They're looking for his blessing. It's a love with a hook. It's a love that wants to use God to get the things that they want. No, 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 no. That's not how God wants us to love us. God loves wants us to have a mature love and he wants his agape love to be poured out into our hearts. I need to come to that place and we need to come to that as a pledge is that we love God and we want to bring God back to God the very best part of us. Not what I can get from God or what God can give to me but what can I bring to the Lord as a loving response to him. You see, my friends, because God's love is perfect, God is not turned off by your ugliness and your sin and the things in your life that he's still busy making and fixing and sanctifying in your life. And God is not turned on by the, by the strengths of your life, the gifting of your life, the good things that he's put in your life. God, God is not motivated by that. God loves you. And God wants you to come to him just as you are. And he wants you to know that because of Jesus, because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, you have been accepted. You have been, you have been adopted into his family. And the foundation of your relationship is Jesus' work on your behalf. And when you get that, when you understand that, my friend, you don't run from God, you run to God. And we need to... Really be trusting the Lord and asking the Lord, Lord Jesus, help me to love you, agape, as I experience your agape love flowing to me. The last couple of minutes, I want to talk about the second application of the great commandment. Because Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second, to love your neighbors as yourself. Now this is the horizontal application of God's love and that is to love people as I experience God's love to me the Bible's understanding is that God's love will well up and flow from me to people around me and it's got two ways a left and a right way in which this flows firstly God calls us to love our fellow believers, our fellow brothers and sisters within the kingdom of God, within our church and within the family of God, our spiritual family. The most, and the most basic expression of love for the church, I believe, is manifest in discipleship. Amen? And so we need to, what does discipleship look like? It would include sharing our lives with one another through loving and caring for one another. It would be training and equipping each other. It would be encouraging, teaching, and correcting and rebuking one another in love because we want to see each other walking into the full destiny, plan, and purpose that God has got for other individuals in the life of this church. 
And all of that would be affecting our heads, our hearts, and our hands. We disciple people and we help people to become the best version of themselves that God has called them and destined them to be. So on the one hand, we display God's love to the church. Amen? On the other, and that is expressed in discipleship in those ways I've mentioned. Then secondly, God wants us to, His love to flow through us to the world, to all of those men and women out there that do not know Him, that have not experienced His love. And the most basic expression of love that we can express to the world as the church is to witness to them. If the most basic expression of God's love to, in the church is discipleship, then the m- most basic expression of God's love that we can share with the world is evangelism. Because if we can, we can do social upliftment, we can do a whole lot of things, but if people don't hear the gospel and they go to an eternal destiny apart from God and they miss heaven and reach hell, then they're going to look up from hell and they're going to say, I thought you said you loved me. Why did you never tell me about this great God, his great love, and this great salvation that you have? And so we need to really trust God and say, Father, help us. Let your perfect love for me cast out the fear of discipleship on the one hand and cast out the fear of rejection of the world on the other hand as I share the gospel with him. Let your perfect love cast out fear of these things so that I can love people in the same way that you have loved me. These are the first two great motivations that God has got for us. Firstly, his great love for us. And then secondly, his great commandment to us, which is to love him and to love people above all else. Why don't you stand with me as I pray. Father, in Jesus' name, as we hear over the next four weeks as a church about your 11 great biblical motivations that you have for us, won't you do heart surgery on us? We ask in Jesus' name and help us to align our heart's motivation with you. I pray for every man and woman here, every husband and wife. I pray for every dad and mom. I pray for every business person, every business owner, every employee. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would pour your love into their hearts and that you would pour your love through their hearts and give them a love for their children, give them a love for their spouses, give them a love for their colleagues at work, give them a love for the communities in which they operate, the schools they go to, this great nation of ours, South Africa. And Father God, give us such a love, I pray. Pour your love out in such a way that fear is driven out And Lord Jesus, your love would replace that fear and it would manifest itself through discipleship, loving, caring, teaching, encouraging, correcting and rebuking one another in love to become the men and women that you've called us to be on the one hand. And on the other hand, to the world, Father God, an overwhelming love for them where we share that out of the overflow of your love, our mouths would speak and we'd share the gospel with people in such a way that your kingdom and your love would overwhelm them and that they'd be drawn to you. Lord Jesus, you said it's the goodness and kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And I pray that we would experience your goodness and your kindness as a church. And as we experience it and we receive it, we would be good and kind to all of those around us and that would draw people back to yourself. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lighthouse, God bless you guys. Have a wonderful Sunday. All the best. Ciao.